All right, Sawyer, thank you for that reading. Good to see everyone. Good morning. Good morning, brethren. Good morning, friends. We do have visitors with us this day, and we're thankful for your presence. We invite you back at every opportunity this congregation of Christ meets. We strive to do that, which is written in the Word of God, to worship Him in spirit and in truth as we are here, as we are instructed to bring glory to God, to honor His Son, to remember Him this day, this day that He was resurrected from the dead by His Heavenly Father. We will honor that in this memorial in uh, just a few moments as we remember the death of our Savior. Thank you for being here. And again with Shane, Emma, and Olivia, great news. It's just wonderful news that, that those have responded and they don't know what an impact and an influence and example that says to all kinds of people of all kinds of ages when we see someone young like that respond to the gospel of Christ. And Shane, I, did Jeff baptize Olivia? Okay, that's right. Uh, there's, a, there's an array of mixed emotions that goes through a, a father as he's standing in the water with his child that's obeying the gospel, that only few of us get to do that. I did that with all three of our children, and I can uh, uh, understand what Shane and Jeff go through or went through when that happened. It is a mixed array of feelings, but the most important one is that their son or daughter has obeyed the gospel and responded to that. We're thankful for God for them. As we're reading Hebrews 11, and most of the, the, the lesson this morning will come from Hebrews 11, but we know that without faith, verse 6, that it is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You know, if you made a list of all the important things in your life, and that list I'm sure would be long, that whatever was on that list, I can assure you that they would not, the number one thing list in your life that was the most important, most vital, it would not hold a candle to faith. It simply would not. By faith, we believe that God exists. By faith, we understand that he created all things that we see. By faith, we understand that it is by God's power, his unique and only power, that he sustains the things that he created. We understand that all of these things are by faith. By faith, we believe that he will reward us in heaven. By faith, we have been justified. By faith, we've been saved. By faith, we've been sanctified. We've been set apart from the world. Faith is everything. But I believe that if you and I are going to have the faith, a faith that saves, a faith that endures, a faith that will last, a faith that will be pleasing to God, a faith that will be rewarded. It's not going to be just a little faith. It's not going to be a small amount of faith. That kind of faith is going to be a great faith. It is going to be a magnitude of faith. It is going to be an all-encompassing of faith that involves you. Your life, an all-encompassing faith. If you and I are going to have that kind of faith, a faith that saves, I contend to you this morning, and you'll understand what I mean by this in just a few moments. We're going to have to have more than a million feet of faith. That's a lot of faith. Yet by God's word and by God's will, I say to you also that you can have that amount of faith. You can have that amount of faith, and you can have it even today. A thousand feet of faith. Now, to understand that a little bit and what I mean by that, let's look at chapter 11. You know, Saul, you read 1 and 2. In that beginning part of that chapter, the faith chapter, we gain approval, he says, not by our own goodness, but by a faith in trusting in God. Verse 3, we live with certainty that God created and maintains all things. Verse four, we make sacrifices. There are sacrifices and offerings, but not of our own design or of our own will, of our own request, 
but of the request of God and what God wants. We recognize those things. But look at verse 7. He says, by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness. He says that comes by faith. I submit to you this morning that everything that we need to know and learn about the faith that's going to save us is right here in these points in this verse. Verse 7. Let's look at it. By faith, Noah being warned about, by God about the things not yet seen. You know that Noah had never seen a worldwide flood, never seen it. There are some scholars that debate whether or not Noah even seen rain. We had a little uh, vestibule discussion about that, about the mist from the redwoods from the ocean. And we read about it in the Genesis account that God had that mist that watered the plants. There is something called the hydro-halo effect. And there was a hydro, which is water, around encompassing the earth that caused that. Now, do you know what ages us? You know why we all get old and die? The sun. It ages you. If you don't think so, ask Mae West. She stayed out of the sun. But think about before the flood. How old men lived? 800, 900. They lived a long time. After the flood... Men begin to die just like we die. But so there's debate on whether or not much a flood, a worldwide flood, but Noah probably didn't even see rain. And so God said, but, but, and I look at that point, God spoke of these things that man could not even conceive, even think about. And this is the very beginning point about Noah. It teaches us, this passage teaches us to believe the unbelievable. Nothing that God told Noah made sense. Nothing that God told Noah could be conceived by anyone. Thousands, millions of people couldn't conceive what God, maybe Noah couldn't even conceive it. But look back to Genesis chapter 6. God told him that it would be so. Genesis chapter 6 verse 17. Notice what he says. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth, God said, shall die. Now, two of those things are unbelievable to know. Two of those things, and even knowing the things that we know right now, living today, a worldwide flood. You think about that. That's, that's hard to imagine. That's hard to believe that that could happen. That the mountains would be covered up. That the springs of the earth would shoot up. All of that water. How inconceivable, how unbelievable that must have been to know. Even now, they debate that. That didn't happen. It was a local flood. It was just around where Noah was. It wasn't worldwide. That couldn't have happened. See how the debate still lingers. It's unbelievable that that happened. It can't happen. But you know what? Even more unbelievable than that happening. In that verse, God says that he will destroy, he will kill every man, every woman, every child, every animal that is on the face of the earth, the sin of mankind, if they don't repent. Now that to me is unbelievable. Worldwide flood, you know that's a lot to take in. But by faith, Noah took that in. Noah believed those two things, and because he believed those two things, it saved him, and it saved his family. Let me tell you something early on. You're going to need that size of faith. You're going to, in fact, need more faith than Noah had when you have the faith that is required by Jesus Christ. Why is that? Well, because God has promised things that you've not yet seen. Things that you'll never see in your life until they happen. God's promised some of those things are going to happen. Turn with me to 2 Peter. Notice 2 Peter. Chapter 3. He says this in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved 
and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all of these things are thus to be dissolved and happen, what sort of people ought you to live your lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be what? Set on fire, dissolved. The heavenly bodies will melt. They will burn, he says. I can't comprehend that. You know how many days I've sat and thought about that? How long have you meditated on what that day will be like? I don't understand how God's going to do that. I can't imagine the roar that's going to happen. I can't imagine the sound. I can't imagine what I'm going to hear. I can't imagine how he's going to burn up the heavenly bodies. We've been talking a little bit in the, on Wednesday night class about the vastness of the universe. We, we've not even skimmed the surface of the vastness of the heavenly bodies. All of the physical things are going to be burned up and destroyed. You know what? A lot of times people do not accept what they can't comprehend. You know that? A lot of people don't believe that because they just can't comprehend that. Do you have that kind of faith? Do you believe that God said it's going to happen and it's going to happen? To me, it's unbelievable. But you know what? I need to believe it. But you know, the earth and the heavenly bodies, everything physical that God created is going to be burned up. That's not the most unbelievable thing that's going to happen on that day. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. Paul writing to them, verse one, well, really, he begins there, but look at verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. Talking about the same thing Peter was, inflaming fire, inflicting, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. On that day, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Yeah, that day is unbelievable, but even more unbelievable that millions, perhaps billions of people because of their disobedience will be turned away from God and into an everlasting hell. That's unbelievable to me. To how that's going to happen. I, I can't comprehend that. I can't even begin to conceive how that's going to happen. We all have thought about the judgment. We've thought about that happening. Is it going to be a long line? I'd say it's going to be a long line. For, you know, all those things. The discussions and all the... I, I, I believe it's going to happen. You know why? Because of faith. Because God said it. You know what? That's the faith of Noah. You talk about Noah. It is a faith that believes what man would say is unbelievable. What God told Noah is unbelievable. But he believed it. What God tells us by his same word is unbelievable. But because of the evidences of Noah... And all the other evidences in the word of God that when God said it, he did it, I need to believe it. It may sound unbelievable and I may have never seen it and I may have never been able to even comprehend it in my finite mind. But I believe it. And we need to believe it. And when you begin to believe that, you believe, begin to have the, the faith of Noah. This morning, do you believe? Do you believe the unbelievable? Back to chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark. Now, these things haven't been seen, unbelievable, prepared an ark. Now, does that sound easy to you? Oh, you mean an ark. Let's build that. No, I mean an ark. No blueprints. He didn't go to shipbuilding school. No power tools. Man, oh man, we're going to do this now? He prepared an ark because of things that hadn't been seen. Now remember that. But we're talking about a saving faith. We're talking about a saving faith that accomplishes the seemingly impossible. Turn back to Genesis chapter 6. Again, notice what he says. Verse 14. Here you go. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. I can do that. You can just see, no, here's the Lord talking. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Got you. Gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. I can do that. Lean to two or three rooms. That's plural. We'll take care of that. All right. This is how you're going to make it. 
The length of the ark is 300 cubits. The breadth is 50 cubits. Its height is 30 cubits. Make a roof, all right, for the ark. Finish it. But right now, Noah's zoned out, okay? What, roof, uh, make, make it with lower, second, and third decks, windows. What? What? You lost me. Now, 450 feet long. I've never built a boat. 75 feet wide. 45 feet high. I'll tell you what, that's a lot of boat. And you know how long it took Noah to build that boat? Most scholars say about 75 years, give or take. All right? Now, you know what that is? That's nothing but one of our lifetimes. You know what? It doesn't say much, and I, and I kind of skimmed over the, the instruction there, and then, of course, God says a little bit more. It doesn't say about much about Noah's reaction, except when you get to verse 22. Do you see what it says? Verse 22, just three words. Thus Noah did. Thus Noah did. By faith, I believe. If God has asked me to do it, it's going to be done. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, I'm going to do it. No power tools, no experience, no that's more. Now, you multiply that out. You know what that is? That's more than a million cubic feet of nothing but pure faith. That's what built that ark. Over a million feet of nothing but pure faith is what built the ark. You know what? We've got some arcs in our life to build. We really do. All of us do. Arcs that God has asked us to build. And oftentimes those things in our life, those arcs in our life seem impossible. But remember, we're talking about a saving faith that looks at the impossible and says, I'm going to do it. Things that we think, well, maybe we can do it, but then if it's going to take me 75 years to do it, that almost seems impossible. I'll never be able to do that. But Noah's not alone. Noah's not alone, is he? Many men and women have done the impossible in the name of Christ. They have. In the faith chapter, in chapter 11, before the Lord came to the earth, there was great men that walked upon this earth. Abraham, he talks about him, verse 11. Abraham left his family, took a small group out to this land that he'd never been in, lived in tents, offered his only son Isaac. All of those things, great moments of faith for great men of faith that would be thinking the impossible. This is impossible. But because God said it, I'm going to do it. Moses, verse 24, chapter 11, he refused Pharaoh's riches to have all that of Egypt, the greatest country in the world, and he left it, left it all. Why? The faith that seemed impossible lived on his own. By faith, men and women have built some mighty big boats. We have built some mighty big boats. Do you know that the ark began with just one piece of wood? Just one piece of wood. And it might be for you that that might be the beginning for you this day. That that piece of wood is that you're going to repent of your sins. That you're going to submit to Christ. Submit to His will. Quit living like the world and live after the Savior. That first piece of wood for you today might be humble submission and obedience to the gospel of Christ. It simply might be that. But you know what? One board does not build a boat. It simply does not build a boat. Look around. What kind of faith do we have? A lot of faith is what we need. And here we take these boards, those obstacles of the past, the problems of the present, our worries about the future, the trials and temptations that we're going to have in the life of Christ is going to take what? A lot of faith. A lot of faith. Noah did it. Noah did it by his faith. And by faith, if God asked me to do it, I must do it. I must face those things. And that means from the initial stages of my obedience to the gospel to where I begin to grow and develop and, and, and changing the habits of my life. The habits of what I do on Sunday evening. The habits of what I watch on TV. The habits of how I speak. The habits of how I dress. The habits of how I act around my kids. The habits of how I act around my children. I have to change those things. That's what that means. My way of living. You know what those are? Those are all cubic feet in the construction of the ark that you're building. 
All of those things are. All of those changes that you're making. You're building that ark. Faith believes that you can do it. I'll tell you what, it may take years coming. Years coming. With all kinds of trials and all kinds of tribulation. And you may think sometimes it's going to be impossible to finish the task that the Lord has given you. But I'll tell you what, if God asks me to do it, I can do it. And with God, all things are possible. We're taught that. All things are possible with God. That is the faith. That is required of us. Well, let's go back. Verse 7. You know, in reverence, he prepared the ark. But I want to ask the question, why did he prepare the ark this morning? He did it in reverence. What was the abiding thing that you think kept Noah going for all of those years? You know, he's using some caveman rock, some sharpened rock. He's cutting gopher wood and whatever prehistoric saw he got, he breaks, and you know what I mean? I mean, you think he got a little tired, lost his motivation sometimes, and, and you think, this ain't gonna be easy. What kept Noah going? Well, the faith that saves is driven by those that are perishing. That's what that verse says. You see it in verse seven? He did it to save his family. It's in that verse. Noah did it to save his family. He wanted his wife to be saved. He wanted his children to be saved. He wanted his children's wives to be saved. And you look at the passage and you remember the preaching was not just his family. For 75 years, Noah preached to anybody and everybody that would hear him. Noah loved everybody and he loved the truth of God. And so he preached, 2 Peter, look at it. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Peter says this, if you did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, and there's our word, he's a preacher of righteousness, Roy, as some translations say, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Noah was not just in it for himself. He was not just in it for himself. Saving faith, first of all, is because God, of God, but it takes a hold. And it takes footing because of others, the precious souls of others, all right? You know, you go a little bit further in that text, and he's not talking about Noah. Look down at verse 9. What he's talking about is about judgment and God rendering judgment. But notice what he says. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until, he says, the day of judgment. All that saying is, that the Lord knows how to save the faithful and he knows how to cast aside those that don't trust him. That's what that means. But look around. We've got a lot of kids. We've got a lot of grandkids. Your children. My children. We have children here. People that are going to be influenced by you and the things that you say and do and your life that you're living. You know what? They're not going to build unless you do. They're not going to build unless you do. Right now, the hammer's in your hand. They're watching you build. They're seeing you build. Ephesians chapter four or 6, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Raise them up in the nurture, the teaching, the admonition of the Lord. How vital is that? I'm serving God because He's God. I'm serving God because I want to go to heaven but I'm serving God because I want to save my family. I want my family in heaven. I want them there with me. Well, things come and go, don't they, in those family scenes, but you know what? And it gets tough. But we need to look at it as simply another trial, another place, and another time to show our faithfulness to our children. Look at your kids, parents. Will they get to heaven without you? Do they need you for that example, that influence? Will they find faith without you? You know, there's more going on in that 75 years with Noah building that ark than just believing what God said and, and just accomplishing what God has said and the preservation of those seven souls. 
Verse 7, the text goes on to say this, by which he condemned the world. Hey, Noah, what are you doing? What are you doing, Noah? Nothing. What? What are you doing? Nothing. Hey, somebody told me you're building an ark because God said that he's going to kill me. He's going to kill my wife, my children, uh, because of our sins. And somebody said you're building an ark, uh, a, a boat so that you, can, you and your family can get on it. Is that right? Nah. It's just a little project of mine I've got going on, me and my boys. No big deal. Let me tell you something. If Noah approached his work like that, I think it would probably started raining right to him. What do you think? I think it would have. Noah's act of faith was more than just his own trust in God. Saving faith has a purpose. And it has a purpose that we don't like to talk about. The purpose of convicting the condemned. That's what this passage says. Noah, what are you doing? I'm building an ark. Why? Because God's going to destroy the world and you're going to die and perish in your sins if you don't repent and help me start building this boat. You believe that's going to happen really? Come on now. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I want to do what God says and I want you to repent of your sins and help me build this boat because it's going to happen. Hey, listen, I, I take offense to that. You're talking about me and my wife and my children. You shouldn't say those things. I'm building this boat because you're going to perish. And you can get on it with me or you can stay here. That offends me. Convict the condemned. Noah convicted the condemned. Saving faith believes in the cause of Christ and has a voice to proclaim it. That's the saving faith that we need today. It does things to please God for God, it does not matter what people say. It does not matter what people do. It does not matter what people say about you, about living for Christ. Because you're exposing their sin. Well, how did he do it? He might have done it by his preaching. But I'll tell you what, it was certainly his devotion to God's will and God's word. That exposed a lot of people. You know that? How many hundreds and thousands of people went by and seen Noah doing what he did? Exposed their sin. Should he have stopped building the ark because it made people mad? Should he quit? Should he quit preaching when most people didn't want to hear? 1 Peter chapter 2. Notice verse 11. Behold, he says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. All right? There's a reason about this. Jesus talked about this, about your light shining. Don't hide it under a bushel. If you're a Christian, let people know you're a Christian because that light illuminates the dark corners of their life. It exposes their wickedness. They don't like it. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they do. Why? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. On the day of visitation, he says. You know, I look at that passage. I wish I could have a little bit more optimistic point to make in this point. I wish I could tell you that there were a hundred people that helped Noah. I wish I could tell you that there were a thousand people that listened to Noah's preaching and got on the ark of safety, but that wasn't what happened. He preached and preached a herald of righteousness. Nobody got on the boat but Noah. That just didn't happen. I'm going to tell you something. God is in the result business. We're not in the result business. If God wants to influence your coworker because of you, however he wants to do, that's his business. Your friend, your relative, your neighbor. What God needed Noah to do was to show the world what true faith was. That's what we need to do. And the reason he did that was because God could demonstrate the difference in what he would do with the one that would live by faith and the one that would reject and stand convicted. That's our job. By our words, we will influence others. Certainly by our actions, we will. Are you willing to live the way the Lord speaks to live? Are we willing to show that kind of faith? Remember what the Lord said in Matthew 10? 
He who confesses me before my Father, him I will, or before, before others, him I will confess to my Father in heaven. He who denies me, you know the rest of that. You're going to live by faith? You're going to live by that kind of faith? Let's stand up for what we believe in. It doesn't matter what they like. It doesn't matter what they like or do. We need to have that kind of faith in order to be Christ-like. Let us live in a way that God will be honored in my life and that others will see because of my life the foolishness of their life so that they'll repent and turn to God. Well, he did condemn the world and you know what? Sadly, no one responded. No one. But at the end of Hebrews eleven seven. look what the verse says. He became an heir of righteousness which is according to faith. That sounds good, doesn't it? Now, I don't know the full impart of that phrase, but I do know what it means. It means, I think it means, that, that as you look at that, this previous list in this verse, everything that we've said in this verse, that Noah did, all of those things, all right, and Noah's willingness to build the ark by faith, Noah assessed the unattainable. Because of all these things, Noah assessed the unattainable. You know what? Nobody is worthy to be an heir of God. Nobody. None of us. There's not a worthy heir in this room. There's not a worthy heir in this world. Nobody. Anywhere. No matter what you've done, no matter how much good you've done, no matter how much love you've given, no matter how of all the good works you've done, Noah was a good man. I'd say he was a cut above a few. And you know what Noah was? A sinner. He was a sinner just like you and I. Though a better person, he did not deserve salvation. He simply did not. In fact, of his own free will, as with ours, being an heir of righteousness is unattainable. It's unattainable. There are no heirs. Look what he says, Genesis chapter 6. Go back again. He says this, verse 5. Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man and it was great on the earth. Every intent and thought of his heart was on evil continually. But that's the world. Look at verse 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so after that, you go down to verse 14. He says, you need to build me an ark. That's what happens. God asks for faith. A living, obedient, active, trusting faith. If Noah would respond in faith, what did that mean? Just build a boat that's over a million cubic feet. That's all that meant. And when he done that, it's a lot of faith. You think that was enough to earn him salvation? No, it was not. That was a great feat, but you know what? He still was not a worthy heir. What made him a worthy heir? What's the point? The point is that it was what God asked him to do. And he did it. That was the point of Noah. You know, God was patient with Noah. I can't imagine. I know he had some tough days. Some estimates about building the ark are 150 years. I'm sort of tending to be in between those years, but that, that's a long time. And I'm sure there are tough days. All the ridicule that he took and all the, all the, the, the whatever, the persecution that he took while he was building that ark all of those years. Can you imagine, you know, well, you know, well I just got a half a million more cubic feet to go. I'm sure that it weighed heavy on him. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. Notice what he says. When the patience, look at that. When the patience of God kept waiting for Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Folks, without God's grace, salvation is impossible. It is impossible, but with faith, Noah's faith, salvation is unmistakable God will provide he will be patient with you he will be long suffering with you he will live with your imperfections he will allow you to grow even though it seems impossible and Satan wins over and over again he will appreciate your continual repentance and your humility before him he recognizes that you're going to put up a board. You're going to realize that thing's warped. You're going to have to take it down. 
You need to take it down. And you need to get up another board and nail it. That's what we're talking about. Recognizing that. Do you have the faith that accesses the unattainable? Do you have that kind of faith? To be able to access what is unattainable corresponding to everything in that verse in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 20 verse 21 says now baptism does save us the like figure as he's talking about keeping it in context but you know what this verse is not teaching that if you are baptized in water that you are a worthy heir that's not what that means you can never be worthy of that but by faith you know what God's going to call you an heir anyway not by what you've done that's the grace of God but your ark this morning, at least the first board, maybe it is just obeying the gospel. Maybe it is. And beginning a life of serving God. Maybe you've done that and not served God. Maybe it's time you took the first board, put it up, nailed it, realized it, submitted to God, and begin once again, listen, I'm going to work on this thing, and it may take me a lifetime to get it right, and something tells me even then, it might not be right. Galatians chapter 3. Talking about being an heir once again, that which is unattainable, anything by who we've been talking about, man's understanding of it. Had somebody stop by the house yesterday and didn't know I was a preacher, I hadn't seen him for 40 years. And they come out of that car and they said, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Seems impossible to them. Galatians chapter 3. Listen to this. 26. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. How? Through faith. Through faith, he says. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, until you do that you're outside of him. Into Christ, he says, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. By faith, through baptism, through a constant process of construction in your life, like men who've gone before us, Abraham, Moses, all of those men, we are saved forever, saved in Christ. Why? Because we did what was asked of us. By faith, therefore, the Lord will give us the unattainable. No access to that. We have access to that. Noah, more than a thousand feet of faith. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. More than a thousand feet. And I submit to you this morning that I think it's going to take more faith than that. More than a million feet. I said a thousand. More than a million feet. Noah was asked to believe that the flood was coming, and he did. We're asked to believe that Jesus Christ rules this world. He's the king of the world. He's the judge. He is the king of this citizenship that we have, this kingdom. And he asks us to submit to him. And he wants us to recognize and know that his power is going to be revealed. We talked a little bit about it. By the blowing of the trumpet. And you know what? With more faith, here's some good news. There comes more reward. Last passage, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, notice the last two verses. All of these, though commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God has provided what? Something better for us, that apart from us they should what? Be made perfect, be made whole. Noah was given great promises, and he acted on those promises. We're given even greater promises with greater rewards. Can we act on that kind of faith? Can we? Do we? Is it time to believe the inconceivable? Can we not? Know God is the ruler of the universe. Know that we should submit to Him to accomplish the impossible, to be able to access the unattainable through the words of God to preserve the precious souls that are around you, including yours. Convict the condemned. Is it time? No matter what people say, how I live my life, I'm going to live it Christ-like to access the unattainable. 
The question you need to ask is, is it the day that you're going to finally pick up that board and nail it and begin to build the ark of life for you this day? Build the ark. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That's the gospel. Go into all the world and preach that. That was the commission. The great commission. The only commission that we preach and teach here. If you've sinned in a public way, you've obeyed the gospel. You brought reproach upon the body. You want forgiveness for that? We'll certainly pray with you. God will forgive you. This congregation will too. You can be added once again to the saints. We know the hearts of no one. Whatever is standing between you and the cross, we would encourage you to come this day as together we stand and sing.